welcome. And if you think you haven't been to church, you weren't listening to the music. It was great this morning. A Mighty Fortress is Our God is one of my favorites. And um, for those of you that don't think there's a TV influence, I remember as a child watching Davy and Goliath, and they played A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Welcome to First Church, and welcome to a Sunday that we come to consecrate our pledges, and welcome to a Sunday that we are going to dedicate our parking lot. Yay! Um, we are so thankful for that to be, there are little fine, fine night things that still need to be, minute things that need to be done yet, but for the majority, it is done. So we are so thankful for that to be done, and praise God for the gift of that. If you were with us this morning and you can see your connection card, will you please fill out your connection card? And those online, please fill that out so that we might know your pastoral needs and where you would like to participate in ministry. Your connection card will be giving you a lot of different options come this Christmas as we go forward in mission. And so there are a lot of opportunities for you to go forward in mission and your connection card will let us know where you would like to participate. And as we go forward in mission, we are going forward because God has first loved us. And we have a, a promise to give uh, Christ to the world, a commandment. So please wear a mask. We're still in our mask wearing stage. Um, but hopefully, and keep praying, someday we will be able to not have those. So we're hoping. Next Sunday will be All Saints Sunday, and we will be recognizing in both services those who have gone to the um, triumphant, the church triumphant, and we'll be recognizing them. Um, we also have family Christmas Eve service planned for Christmas Eve. I know you don't think that's very, uh, that's pretty far away, but it is not. <laughs> It's not. Um, we're less than two months away from Christmas. And so our Christmas Eve first service will be at four, and that will be a children's musical. And our uh, traditional Christmas Eve service will be at seven. We are also doing our, clo our coats for kids. And the drive begins today, and it runs through November the 14th. So please donate gently used men's and women's. Um, and they're asking for newer um, children's coats or new ch children's coats. And the box is in the gathering space. The annual stewardship campaign concludes today, and pledge cards will be collected today. Consecration Sunday, there are extra cards available in the pews and at the back of the sanctuary if you happen to forget yours. And today is the Fall Family Fun Fest, and it'll be at the Lookup Center between 2 and 4, and it will include um, costume parade and pumpkin painting and games, and if you would like to help but haven't signed up, you can still come and help us. That would be great. And after this service and at the 10 o'clock hour, we will dedicate the parking lot. Um, so, uh, and honoring those who made it possible, uh, we want to tell you thank you for those who have pledged to the parking lot. Um, if you haven't made a gift but still would like to, please go ahead and, and you can do that. But we also need to be thankful of those that had the foresight um, and the dedication to give to our funds to the church many years ago. It has been an investment, and so we are able to use some of the money that they have given to the church with foresight and understanding that it was to be used for projects such as this. And so we are able to use some of the endowment money to come in and to help us to pay off the parking lot. And we are so thankful for those saints who had the foresight and, and the heart to give. So thank you. Let us continue on with our worship by standing and singing together, Come ye faithful, raise the strain.
You may be seated.
And this morning is our time to consecrate our offerings and our pledges that we are making to the Lord. It is a time where we come giving back for all that the Lord has given us. We can never outgive God. But God is worthy to be praised, and the ministries that he has called us to do are here in ways that we can be participants with God in the creation. So what I'm going to ask you to do, we will stand, and we will sing the doxology, and as we are singing, you are invited to come down and put your um, commitment cards in the two baskets that are here in the front. And as we do that, May God receive the glory. Will you stand? You may be seated. O oh Lord, we come today giving you thanks and praising your name. We ask, Lord, that as we have come forward to give our commitments, will you bless them and use them and multiply them so that your kingdom is established here on earth as well as the kingdom to come. We thank you for the great gift of life and hope and promise. We thank you for your blessings in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you come after us even when we move away from you. You are still there calling to us, coming for us, telling us that you have open arms for us to return to you. Lord, we thank you for that gift. But hear us as we confess our sins that we have moved away from you and not you from us. Lord, we are so sorry for the, the errors and the things that we have committed against you. And we ask that you will remove those from our lives, that we might be able to move closer to you again, Lord, and receive that full open arm welcome. Help us to live our lives to your glory. Help us to do the things that you have called and placed in our lives for us to do in your name. Lord, lead us and direct us. And we thank you, Lord, that you never leave us or forsake us. Lord, we come today, too, lifting up those that are ill and need your healing power. We know that you are the great physician, and we count on your healing power and strength, and we know that it is there. And so, Lord, we thank you for the gift of healing that you provide. And, Lord, we, we come lifting up those that have lost loved ones, and, Lord, help us to see that ultimate healing is being with you. And so that... Death is, for those of us that know you, death is not a, a thing to be feared, but one that we can welcome. But Lord, for those of us who are left, when we lose our loved ones, our hearts are broken. And so Lord, we know that you grieve with us 
and that you are there with us and help heal our broken hearts. Lord, we come lifting up those that are hungering and thirsting for righteousness and who are just hungering and thirsting. Lord, we live in a world where people are going hungry, where children are, are fighting for food, are living to go to school just to be fed. Lord, help us to be your hands and feet in a hurting world. Show us how we might serve. Lord, we, we come thanking you and praising you that you want us to be in a relationship with you. And with that relationship is a friendship and a conversation. Lord, sometimes I bet you feel that it's just one way that we are going to you with our list of, Lord, can you help us with this and this and this? But you've also told us, Lord, to ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. And so, Lord, help us to go to you, but also help us to listen for you. And we ask, Lord, that Sometimes we don't know what to say, but you've taught us what to say by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. Today's scripture lesson comes from Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 16. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to the camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the Ark of the Lord. The seven priests, carrying the seven trumpets, went forward, marching before the Ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the Ark of the Lord, while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What a great story this is. I'm loving this book of Joshua as we're reading through. And in that whole part, whole process we're seeing about victories and successes and obedience and deliverance all of this works together because and I'm going to start that with the number one piece because they put God first they put God first Joshua was there listening to what God was giving him, and they were, he was following the commands that God had said. God was put first in this whole piece of coming together to go into the promised land. And God was leading and guiding and directing. Now, how God led and directed wasn't any ordinary way to win a battle. It was totally different. They weren't going with, with weapons. They were going with the Ark of the Covenant. What is going first? God's going first. It's taking God with them in the Ark of the Covenant as they go around the city. Now, the city wasn't very large, but it was, it was overwhelming because it had all kinds of fortresses, and it was a walled city. And the people, the Canaanites in the city, knew what was going on. They were seeing the armies 
of Israel march around, let alone they could hear it as the, they were sounding the horn. And do you think that they were plotting and planning of how they might revenge, how it might go? Or were they shaking in the boots because they had seen what God had done with the Israelites? God had dammed up the Jordan so that they could cross over and get into the promised land. And they'd heard the stories about how God had parted the Red Sea. And they're seeing how God is working. And, and this God is beyond comprehension. So I imagine that part of it was that they were plotting and planning, but the other part, I think they were probably shaking in their boots, wondering how this was all going to happen. And what were they doing? Were they being crazy? They're just marching around the city, and then they go back to the camp. Now, if we wanted to really analyze and see what what was going on, the Canaanites probably could have left their, their forted city and gone and attacked the Israelites at night. But again, God was put first and God was with them. And in that God was put first and that God was with them, they were obedient to what God had directed them. But to do that, they had to have faith. And they had to have trust. They had to have faith that what God was telling them was, was accurate. What God was doing would take care of them. They had to have faith to understand that no matter if it did not make sense, God would be there with them and God would see them through. Because in the statement that God is talking to Joshua... He uses the past tense. I have given you Jericho. Not I will or someday, but I have given you Jericho. And so he had faith. And the people that were following Joshua had faith because they had seen how Joshua had listened and followed they had faith in him, and they had in the faith in the God who had brought them out of Egypt. They had faith, and they had trust. And so because they had that, then they were also able to be obedient to what God was telling them. Obedient. God says, you're going to conquer the city by blowing the horns and with priests going around. They were obedient. They did it. Wouldn't you think you go, now wait a minute, Lord. This doesn't seem to make sense. I don't know about this, Lord. But the Lord set it up so it would speak to them of all the different things. They went for seven days. Seven is the seven days that God created the earth. It's biblical. Seven days, they even went on the Sabbath, which tells us that what they were doing was not their work because they aren't supposed to work on the Sabbath, but it was God's work that was being done. And so they were obedient. Now think of the large group of people that were there, the Israelites. And it says on the seventh day, and with all the people too, that they were a mass group of people, and it wasn't just the men that went out. It was families. It was children and mothers and daughters and the brothers, and it was all of them together. And did you hear that God told them to be silent? Now, I don't know about you, but I've had a classroom of kids and I've told maybe a classroom of 30. Now, this is sometime you have to be silent. And pretty soon I have a, see a hand raised. But, 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 no, silent. And have you ever played the game with, with kids and with adults? Let's see who can be quiet the longest. 
but they were to go around the city in, in total silence except for the blaring of the horns. Children, women, men, they were to be silent. But it tells us they were obedient. Now what happens when we are obedient? We see how God is faithful. We see how God is there. We see how God's promises come true. But sometimes in that obedience, we have to endure a period of time Things just don't happen in, instantly. They talk about creation and how it happened in seven days. And some of the people who dispute that it happened in seven days, well, they, uh, it couldn't happen. But in my mind, they said it took thousands of years in between. We don't know what God's timing is. God's day is different than what our day could be. And so I believe in God's seven days the world was created. I don't have any problem with that. But it's not a, a, it's not a hundred yard dash, but it's more of a marathon. It takes time. But that's hard for us in our, our society today. We want everything instant. We have the microwaves that get things done quickly. And you've heard me talk about, Jeff says, I do microwaving really well. And then we want everything to happen very fast. They talk about even how we teach children today, that we have to keep things moving. And they even talked about that with us preaching. You have to keep things moving because people are so entertained all the time that if you don't do that, you lose their attention. You have to, to go quick. And when we're out driving, don't we always have to feel like we have to get there the fastest? At least I do. And haven't you watched while speed limits have gone up higher and higher and higher? Rachel and I made a trip to Indianapolis this week. And I was telling her, when I was in grad school... 40 years ago. But when I was in grad school, the trip to Indianapolis took longer than it does today. And she looked at me and she said, Mom, it's the same amount of miles. It couldn't have taken longer. And I said, it did. The speed limit was only 55. And she looked at me again. She said, did you travel that 55? She knows me. I said, no. But the posted speed limits now are 70 and 65. It's faster. Everything's faster. And when, when I grew up, don't you love these stories? When I grew up, my mother had to make oatmeal that you had to cook on top of the stove. It wasn't the instant oatmeal that I fixed my girls that I put it in the microwave for 60 seconds and it was ready to go. We want instant success, instant things, but God is saying he is with us always and it might take some time and God's timing might be different than what we think the timing should be and that we have to endure. It's like the, the pearl the pearl is made because with, with the clam, there is an irritant that goes in. And it's painful. And so what it does is it puts a layer of soothing mother of pearl over that inter irritant. Till after a period of time, the irritant is covered with this beautiful mother of pearl. And a pearl is born. Out of the irritant, out of the pain, came and comes a beautiful peace. God says, endurance. Remember, they were in the desert land. 
for 40 and then 40 more years, they were wandering in the wilderness. They had to endure. But they did. And as they did, God blessed them. As they followed him and put him first, as they believed in him, as they followed what he said and with obedience and had endurance to make it through the long haul, God was there with them. And the last part of all of this was that God was trying to show them, depend on me. You see, they defeated Jericho by blowing horns and shouting. What an unusual way to win a battle. And in the scriptures it says, it happened this one time, it never happened again. But it happened this one time. And it said that God could have gone ahead and made the walls of Jericho fall down all on his own. But he wanted the people of Israel also to participate. So that's why he had them shouting. And just think that as they shouted, the walls came down. I did some study on that too, and it said, some people who doubt what God does said, well, you know, it was an earthquake that made the walls of Jericho come down. But there were some things that happened in that. Rahab's house was not destroyed. Other things that were supposed to be saved were saved. So if it had been an earthquake, everything would have been leveled. But God, God was able to level what needed to be leveled and saved what needed to be saved. Because they depended on God, they were able to take the stronghold of Jericho. And Jericho was the toughest city that they had to accomplish and to take over first. And they took that because it was in the middle and the other cities were here. And everything had to kind of come through Jericho. So they took the hardest and the most treacherous city first. But who taught them to do that? God. So what does all of this mean for us? This is a great story to tell us that we need to put God first in our lives. And that's hard. Because the world comes and it tries to push in. The world tries to seduce us to follow its ways instead of God's ways. It tries to say, oh, it's okay. You don't have to follow God. But it's also telling us, have faith. Have faith, for God is with you. God is there. God loves you. God sent his only son, Jesus, for you so that the walls that you have that are separating him from you can come tumbling down when you say to Jesus, here I am, Lord, please forgive me. Help me live a life to your glory. Take me and lead me in the right directions. And the walls that we have, the barriers that are there, come tumbling down just as Jericho's walls come tumbling down. And when we follow what God tells us to do, we are blessed. Now, I know that there are times that you say, Pastor Bart, how do you know what we're telling, what God is telling us, and what maybe the world is telling us? Or am I just thinking, I want to do this so badly that I think it's right? But here are ways to find out. You look for affirmation. If it's of God, you will find affirmation. One example was one day, early in in my time of being a pastor, I was down in the dumps. Somebody had complained. Something else had broken. The church was in, needed some finances that weren't there. I didn't, wasn't sure how it was all going to work. And I said to myself and to God, Lord, 
And what I, it, what I am doing, does it make any difference? Am I doing the right thing? I think, Lord, I could just go and, and work retail. And so I said, but God, show me. Show me. Give me affirmations that what I'm doing is the right thing. And so God gave me the three affirmations. I was sitting in my office after one Sunday morning, and I was sitting there, and somebody came in my office and said, can I talk to you, Pastor Barb? And I said, sure, come on in. And they said, you know, during your sermon, I heard the Lord calling me into ministry. I said, during my sermon? They, yeah, during your sermon, I heard the Lord calling me into ministry. And I said, okay, all right, let's talk about that. And so we talked about how God calls and God shows and God provides. And they said, you said just the right words for me to hear. They left my office and it was almost like God had lit up a big number one. There's one. I went home, and down the street from me lived a former um, pastor's child. And he just kind of was in the neighborhood, had taught in the neighborhood, had been there, knew it well. And um, he came up to me in my yard that day as I was coming home. He goes, say, I want to tell you something. I said, okay. And I thought maybe it was because I'd let my grass grow too tall. And he said, no, I, I really want to tell you, you're making a difference with that congregation, and the church is making a difference in the community. And he goes, and ultimately, you're making a difference for the kingdom. And I went, well, thank you. And he left, and it was like I heard, that's two. And in the church that I was serving, we were in a poor neighborhood in the hilltop. And we had a kids club. And they would come across, right across the street was John Burroughs Elementary. It was the highest populated then, highest populated elementary in Columbus public system. They had over 700 kids. And because it was mostly a landlord-created area, they would have as many as a hundred switch every month. When the, when the rent came due, people moved out in the middle of the night, and new people came in, and so they would have as many as a hundred switch. And so we did this kids' club program after school. And it started out with, it was just kind of a vacation Bible school every Thursday night, but the thing that we did is that we fed them. And we sang with them, and we read scripture with them, and we colored, and we played games. And so they were there for two hours. Sometimes they would come in, and some of the language they used was not always appropriate. And so I'd have to say, uh, we don't use those words here. And they go, okay. And sometimes I would say, no, I'm sorry, you need to be kind to this other person. And they go, do we have to? I said, yes, that's part of being here. Okay. And sometimes you felt like, they said, well, we aren't having fun. Okay. And trying to figure out ways that you were teaching the scripture, you were having fun, you were taking care of them. And sometimes it was just a hard day. But there was a mom that came in one afternoon to pick up her daughter. She was a single mom. And she said, Pastor Barb, I know some days are rough. I know they're a tough crowd. But you are making a difference. And I looked at her and I said, it was, it's not me, it's the Lord. And she said, 
Yeah, you have something to do with it. And I said, hmm, it's not me. It's the Lord. And she turned around and took her daughter and went home. They became one of our best volunteers. And as she turned around and went home, it was like I heard the Lord going, Barbara, that's three. What you're doing, following me, being obedient, is making a difference. Trust in me. Depend on me. It makes a difference. It makes a difference for who we are as a church, as a congregation. It makes a difference on who we are as individuals. It makes a difference. And when you doubt if it's your will or God's will, look for the confirmation. It will be there. Because then you know you have depended solely on God. Now, I want to take all of these things and say our victories and our success, our obedience and our deliverance can all come together in our commitments. But do you know what? And you're going to laugh at me, but I'm going to say it all comes together in that parking lot, too. For we were at some points wondering where things would come from And there was the endowment and your gifts. We were wondering, is it ever going to happen? And we'd look at it. And they told me in the office this week, they said, we don't know what you're going to do now that the parking lot is finished. Because in the afternoon, it was always, I would go out and survey what was going on and how much needed to get done. Said, now that it's done, what are you going to do in the afternoons? And then there's the part that it makes it so those who can't walk are able to get into the building. Do you know what an important part that is? That you can get here and be here and it's safe. And we don't have to cross that street anymore. It's a gift. It's God answering prayer. It's a way of being in ministry. And we are going to claim it as God's gift and God's part of our ministry. I don't think we have to walk around it seven times. But I do know that we have to give God praise for all that has been given and all that he will continue to give and the ways that we might be in ministry. Will everything be instant? No. But I think this is a beginning. So may we go forth as Joshua and the people of Israel with hope and faith and obedience, endurance, and depending solely on God. Amen. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn together.
So stand on the word of God. Stand on his commandments. Put him first and see what goodness God will bring. Go in his name. Amen. Would you be seated, please? Amen. And before you get up, I have some instructions. First of all, I want you to take your card that says the dedication. Take that out for there's litany for you to be a part of. So take that with you. We also have some cookies. We are Good United Methodist. Where there is a gathering, we will have food. And so there are cookies for you. And um, there are also bubbles, because I think that we need to celebrate with joy and the power of the Holy Spirit. So we will show the bubbles as our, our way of saying thank you and giving praise to God as well. So as we leave.